Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, July 31st, 2024. We are in the book of 2 Kings chapter 9 and verse uh, 30. But before I start reading there, let me recap. Last week, Jehu had been anointed king by one of the associates of Elisha. And he had instituted a rebellion and he had killed the last king of uh, last king that was the son of Ahab and his nephew who was the king of Judah and he is now proceeding to Jezreel where the royal family lives verse 30 then Jehu went to Jezreel when Jezebel heard about it she painted her eyes arranged her hair and looked out the, of a window as Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, Zimri, you murderer of your master? Let's, let's stop there and get this picture. When it says she painted her eyes and did her hair, she's putting on makeup. And she's looking her best and looking most queenly. She is the queen mother. She is the queen... The, the, the um, mother of the king that he just deposed. Now, who is Zimri? I thought his name was Jehu, right? Well, Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, is his name. Zimri was the man who conspired against her father, well, conspired against the king before her father-in-law, Omri, and overthrew him. And Zimri lasted seven days before he in turn was overthrown by Omri. And Omri became king and Omri's son was Ahab. So Zimri is the equivalent of calling somebody um, Benedict Arnold in here in America. You're the traitor. You're, you're the absolute worst name. He has a reputation. It's been four generations and five kings. And he's still the name of a traitor. So she's calling him directly a traitor. And trying to be very insulting. She's not being nice. She's looking her best. She's looking most regal. She has used all of her influence she can to appear to be the legitimate heir to the throne. And she calls him the short-term king that would de was deposed because of his uh, act of rebellion. She's predicting that he, in turn, will be a very short-term, few-day king before he is, in turn, deposed, disposed, uh, and somebody else rule in his place. And she's planning for that to be her. That's the setup. And she's bluntly, just bluntly calling him murderer of his master, and that he, you know, He's in rebellion. He's, you know, she's going all out. Verse 32. He looked up at the window and called out, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. So he calls up, and the eunuchs were the ones who stayed with the royal women. If you couldn't have sex, nobody worried about you being inappropriate with the queen or the princes, the princesses, or the uh, the royal wives or the whatever. And so they were used extensively to be servants in the royal household for the women, to be their protectors, to be their. They, I'm not going to go into the full details of why that works here, but it was common. 
And so two or three eunuchs look out the window and he commands them throw her down and they just grab her and pitch her out the window. She falls to her death on the ground. Her blood splatters. Jehu's horses ride across her and trample her under. So he's being equally insulting to her. Verse 34. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, who said, This is the word of the, the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like refuse on the ground in the plot at Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, This is Jezebel. So, and he invokes Yahweh's name. That When he says Lord here, he's invoking Yahweh's name. He is saying, This is fulfillment of the prophet's word, of Yahweh's word, about Jezebel. And it was. And he was quoting that. Now, he's been anointed by a prophet of Yahweh as king. He's now pointing out that he's fulfilling the prophecies that were made about Ahab's family, Omri's family, Jezebel's family, that Elijah had made. And he's invoking that authority because he wants the people to understand this is something they can't control. It's going to help him to get into leadership if everybody thinks this is an act of God. It's not an act of Jehu. And let's face it, in the length of time it took him to eat a meal, the dogs devoured her body so all that was left was a skull and hands and feet. I mean, that's almost a miracle right there. Yes, the dogs were scavengers in the city. They were not pets. Uh, they were village dogs. And they were not, uh, you know, people didn't feed them. They didn't tend them. They didn't care for them. They threw refuse out, and that's what the dogs ate. And they were the scavengers that kept the city relatively clean. If you left a body out, they would eventually get around to it. But it, normally the dogs in the city didn't immediately eat a dead human. God told these dogs to eat her that quickly. And they had to gang up on it to get the body and make it all disappear. Let's face it, uh, the dogs to eat the femurs and things like that... Um, that's some hard work. And to do it quickly is hard work. Now, getting the flesh so there's a skeleton left, that would be relatively easy. Eating some of the softer uh, bones would also be fairly easy. God performed the miracle that the dogs would eat everything in the length of time it took Jehu to eat a meal. The people understood that was an act of Yahweh. And that Jehu is pointing out that is the fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy. He's invoking that this is from Yahweh. And that what he's doing is from Yahweh. So he's buying into, in a public sense, the revival of that's been going on under Elijah and Elisha. And Je Jezebel didn't get to be buried, like Elijah said. Verse 10, I mean, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Now there were in Samaria 70 sons of the house of Ahab. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the officials of of Jezreel to the elders and the guardians of Ahab's children. 
He said, As soon as this letter reaches you, since your master's sons are with you, and you have chariots and horses, a fortified city and weapons, choose the best and most worthy of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne. Then fight for your master's house. But they were terrified and said, If two kings could not resist him, how can we? So he's inviting them to set up this civil war and anoint somebody as king to keep the house of Ahab alive and that they will have a civil war. His men will fight against the people who want to keep Ahab's family in charge. And, you know, he's offering them, let's do this the way most countries would do this. Set up a king and we'll set up a civil war and we'll fight to see who wins. But they're scared. They say this is the guy that's killed, killed, killed two kings. The one that was sitting on the throne that was very capable and his nephew that ruled in Judah. And what? And we've got children here. Uh, what can we do? And they're basically saying, hey, if God's Yahweh's done that, uh, we can't do anything. We're not, we're not going to do this. Verse 5. So the palace administrator, the city governor, the elders, and the guardians sent this message to Jehu. We are your servants, and we will do anything you say. We will not appoint anyone as king. You do whatever you think best. Then Jehu wrote them a second letter, saying, If you are on my side and will obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come to me in Jezreel by this time tomorrow. So they say basically, no, nah, we're not going to rebel against you. We're going to be your servants and your king, and we're not going to set up one of his sons as king. Give us directions. And he says, okay, if you're not going to rebel, kill all of his sons and bring me the heads in Jezreel by tomorrow. He gives them 24 hours. That's plenty of time to execute 70 boys, basically, and bring, get to Jezreel from the palace. Uh, middle of verse um, 6. Now the royal princes, 70 of them, were with the leading men of the city who were rearing them. So this tells us a lot about how princes were raised in that day. Yes, very often they were raised both their mothers, but they were also very often not raised by the king. He was not their father. He would farm out the task of fathering his children to leading people in the city who would raise them with their own children, school them with their own children, and then teach them what they would need to know. And that would form relationships. The reason you do that is... If you happen to get the son that became a king, your children would be the close friends, almost brother-like, with the future king. And, okay, if it was one of the sons that became the advisor to his brother, the king, you still had an in to the next generation royal family. Um, you were, you know, close and you had somebody who could influence things for you and who would sit at court and would be an advisor to the king, etc. And you therefore had business connections with the royal household and etc. And so these people would be carefully selected. Generally, they already were people who had influence in the court and etc. And this was a way to extend that in influence to the next generation, raise the king's children. And they would become, you know, the advisors and the people in the court, the next generation. So your sons would get a chance to have that influence that you had on the court. And um, so people would quite happily do that. And this is the one case in Scripture we find that it's explicitly said that way. But there's indications elsewhere. It was a fairly common practice. It was common practice all over the Middle East, and uh, apparently it was Judah was the only country where it was not routinely practiced. Most of the time, the king helped raise his own children. Now, 
how well that worked, we can look at and think, yeah, it didn't work so well a lot of the time. It looks like a lot of those kings had no influence with their children, with their successor. But, you know, um, that was the only country in the Middle East where it wasn't practiced. Israel it was, most of the surrounding countries it was. Uh, we have text from Syria and Assyria and Aram and Babylon and Egypt where this was done. And so it was really common all through the Middle East. And we suspect it was just the way it was done. Nobody questioned it. So they're out with the families that are raising them to be royals. Verse 7, When the letter arrived, these men took the princes and slaughtered all 70 of them. They put their heads in baskets and sent them to Jehu at Jezreel. When the messenger arrived, he told Jehu, They have brought the heads of the princes. Then Jehu ordered, Put them in two piles at the entrance of the city gate until morning. So, the men that were raising these sons of Ahab were the ones that killed the sons of Ahab. They're the ones that finished the act of destroying his sons. They did it somewhat out of fear of Jehu, somewhat out of fear of the circumstances. Uh, they probably felt abandoned that they weren't fixing to have any influence at all. And some of them, we're going to learn, did lose their lives. But um, some of them probably were thinking, this is the only way I'm going to save my life. And so they kill them. They send the heads to Jezreel. He has them piled in two piles outside the city gate. Verse 9. The next morning, Jehu went out. He stood before all the people and said, you are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that not one word of the Lord has been spoken against the house of Jahab will fall or fail. The Lord has done what he has promised through his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed everyone in Jezreel who remained of the house of Ahab, as well as all his chief men, his close friends, and his priests, leaving him no survivor. Um, so he cleaned camp in Jezreel and didn't just kill the family. He did something more radical. He committed, um, anybody that was uh, killed, anybody who is even a friend of the house of Ahab. And apparently when it says it killed the whole house, he was killing wives and concubines and servants and slaves and everybody. That was not a common practice in the Middle East. It was done occasionally when there was a serious violent overthrow of the government. But normally it took a civil war to get there. And when it was so severe that there was an internal fight and two armies fought and one of them won, then the surviving, the winning army would go in and destroy everybody that had supported the other army. It was unheard of for somebody who did a coup to kill everybody, women and children and servants and everybody that's what happened and he did that in Jezreel verse 12 Jehu then set out and went towards Samaria at Beth Echid of the shepherds he met some relatives of Ahaziah king of Judah and asked who are you they said we are relatives of Ahaziah and we've come down to greet the families of the king and the queen mother. He, Take them alive, he ordered. So he took them alive and slaughtered them by the well of Beth Eckerd, 42 men. He left no survivor. So he is killing all the house of Ahab, even the ones that are in Judah. 
they've come up to visit their relatives in Israel. And he slaughters all of them. He's killing all the house of Ahab, not just the men, not just the ones that are in Israel. He's killing everybody. And if they're relatives of the king in Judah, they're going to get caught. He's making a clean sweep. Verse 15. After he left there, he came upon Jehonadab, son of Rechab, who was on his way to meet him. Jehu greeted him and said, Are you in accord with me as I am with you? I am, Jehonadab answered. If so, give me your hand. And so he did, and Jehu helped him up into the chariot. Jehu said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Then he had him ride along in his chariot. When Jehu came to Samaria, he killed all who were left there of Ahab's family. He destroyed them according to the word of the Lord spoken to Elijah. So, he takes this Jonadab son of Rechab into his chariot and, you know, they greet each other. They basically are making a pact to support each other. Now, why is that name important? If you'll remember when we were in Jeremiah, and when we were studying Jeremiah, when the siege of Jerusalem was happening, and ever, there was famine in the land, and the Babylonians were fixing to capture the city, Jeremiah preached a object lesson sermon. He called the descendants of Jonadab, son of Rechab, in and gave them bowls of wine to drink and says, drink wine, and they say, no, we're not going to drink wine because our ancestor, Jonadab, son of Rechab, made his family swear that we would live in tents and we would not drink wine and give several other things and we have obeyed that to this day. The only reason we're in Jerusalem is because the army's in the land. But we're still living in our tents in Jerusalem. And then Jeremiah preached the, uh, the sermon, hey, if these guys can obey their ancestor because he told them to, why can't you obey your God? This is that Jonadab son of Rechab. And this is where he's mentioned. He is part of the revival that was going on under Elisha. And the rest of the chapter we're going to get into part of what he did. But this is where he comes in. And that is this chapter and then those few chapters in Jeremiah are the only mention of him till we get to the genealogy of Jesus whereupon he's in the genealogy. Kind of interesting. And um, he is you know, he was a peculiar man, apparently, but he was part of who had come to Yahweh and was worshiping Yahweh. Verse 18. Then Jehu brought out all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. Now summon all the prophets of Baal, all his ministers, all his priests, see that no one is missing because I am going to hold a great sacrifice for Baal. Everyone, anyone who fails to come will no longer live. But Jehu was acting deceitfully in order to destroy the ministers of Baal. So he calls this grand assembly and says, everybody who worships Baal, come here. And if you don't come... I'm going to kill you because you're not faithful enough. We're going to have a big feast. We're going to worship him really hard. And hey, the you know, 
they go, oh, Ahab and his family have been overthrown. Everybody's killed. Are we fixed to fall out of favor? Oh, he's fixing to hold this big festival. Yeah, okay, great. We're in with the new king. Out with the old, in with the new. Let's all come. Let's all worship. He's threatening if we don't come, he's going to kill us. Man, everybody's going to attend, right? And so they all come. Uh, verse 20, Jehu said, Call an assembly in honor of Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then he sent word through all, throughout Israel, and all, and all the ministers of Baal came. Not one stayed away. The, they crowded into the temple of Baal until it was full from one end to the other. And Jehu said to the keeper of the wardrobe, Bring robes for all the ministers of Baal. So he brought out robes for them. He's giving them clothes. In that day and time, that was a sign of honor. That was a sign of, I'm going to support you, particularly when the king did it. And he was pulling them out of the royal uh, coffers. And, um, you know, they, in the cultural thing of the time, they just know he is on their side. And they are confident this king is going to be worshiping Baal too. And they don't suspect a thing. Doesn't matter what Jehu's doing elsewhere. If they saw the army out there, they're thinking, would he give me a robe to kill me? Let's face it, a robe was several months' work by a person to make the thread and then make the cloth and then make the robe. And a royal or a priestly robe was more ornate and more expensive and probably caught several more months worth of labor. So you're probably talking six months to a year of labor of one person or the equivalent of several people, you know, in the process. So it's not, it's not a cheap thing. It's a very expensive gift he's giving every one of them. And he's done it for everybody that came in from no matter where they were in Israel. And he's promised that anybody that stays behind is going to get killed. So they're all there, and they don't suspect a thing, because who would give that kind of expensive gifts to somebody they're going to kill, right? That's not the way things are done, right? They're safe, right? Nope. Verse 23. Then Jehu and Jonah, Jonah, Jehonadab, son of Rechab, went into the temple of Baal. Jehu said to the ministers of Baal, Look around and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, only ministers of Baal. And, by the way, that's Yahweh. So they went in to make sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had posted 80 men outside with this warning, If any one of you lets any of the men I am placing in your hands escape, it will be your life for his life. So he's giving orders, don't let anybody escape, and if you do you're going to be convicted and killed. And so he's going in. He's made sure that nobody is a servant of Yahweh that's in there. It's just servants of Baal, of Baal. And they're made sure that everybody is there and nobody that's not faithful to Baal is there. And then he set these guards around it and says, you're going to kill everybody. Verse 25, as soon as Jehu had finished making the burnt offering, he ordered the guards and officers, go in and kill them. Do not let no one escape. So they cut them down with the sword. The, the guards and officers threw the bodies out and then entered the inner shrine of the temple of Baal. They brought the sacred stone out of the temple of Baal and burned it. They demolished the sacred stone of Baal and tore down the temple of Baal. And the people have used it for for a latrine to this day. So he kills all the leadership of the worship of Baal and they desecrate the temple and they take out the uh, basically the idol uh, and it is a sacred stone and we don't totally understand what the sacred stone was uh, for the worship of Baal meant uh, that has been destroyed with the worship of Baal. But it was part of the ritual. And they burn it, which was desecrating it, and then they destroyed it. They broke it up. 
and they tore the temple down and turned it into a latrine. How ignoble to take a house of worship and make it literally a, a place where you just use the restroom. And that's all its only function. And they desecrated it with human excrement from that time forward. And it becomes, until the uh, Assyrians destroy the land, a latrine. And that's where people go use the restroom in public. Verse 28. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. However, he did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. So he claimed to worship Yahweh. But he also claimed the two idols made by Jeroboam son of Nebat were Yahweh. And this tells me that the revival that Elijah and Elisha were leading was probably one where people worshipped Yahweh in spirit and truth but they did it through the customs that they had become accustomed to. They weren't obeying the law of Moses as implemented by David and Solomon at the temple. They may have had the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, with them, but they were doing it at the altars, at the golden bulls, at Bethel and Dan. And so the writers of the Chronicles, when they wrote it from Babylon after contemplating in captivity for the 70 years they were in captivity, contemplating this, they concluded that this was not um, a real revival to Yahweh, that they didn't do it right, and that God destroyed them and destroyed even the southern kingdom for continuing that kind of thing. Now, 350 more years of contemplation by the time of Jesus, they had concluded that Elijah and Elisha were indeed prophets of Yahweh and doing Yahweh's work. And they had forgotten that they were leading a revival in which they were worshiping at Bethel and Dan, not at the temple the temple that was no longer there that had been destroyed because people worshipped other gods in that temple. Um, so historians have to reinterpret and the historians that wrote it down to make the book of Kings concluded Jehu worshipped Yahweh and worshipped him faithfully but still continued to worship the idols, so didn't do correctly and worshipped incorrectly and continued to do the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat. They were right in that. The historians at, in the captivity that wrote Chronicles said, hey, that whole revival was a fake revival. It wasn't wasn't real and they ignored it and they ignored the leaders of it and they basically ignored the kings of Israel and so they don't count any of it as worthy of being God's worship but centuries later when Jesus times come around they've come back around to go you know they were leading people to worship Yahweh and we weren't doing any better in the southern kingdom. And God, God led us into captivity. And now we're, okay, we're not building idols, but we're not worshiping at a temple. We're worshiping at, you know, uh, synagogues. And so you can worship Yahweh anywhere and anyhow, but you got to obey the law of Moses. And, if they were worship, obeying the law of Moses, maybe they were doing it right. 
And so as they had contemplated it more, you keep getting different interpretations of this event. My take on it was he never actually worshipped Yahweh, but it was a political move. He didn't want all these other foreign gods. He was going to worship in the way he was used to, which was the idols at Bethel and Dan. And he did not get rid of them, and he did not go down to Jerusalem to worship. And he may have known that the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem was beginning to be corrupted. Because let's face it, um, he does not completely clean out all the uh, descendants of Ahab that are in Jerusalem. He doesn't invade Judah. He doesn't kill the royal family that's there and next chapter we're going to deal with that somewhat and God eventually does take care of that but um, the next king of Judah is a descendant of Ahab God never totally wipes out all the descendants of Ahab because that next king while worshiping Yahweh and being praised as worshiping Yahweh he is an ancestor of Jesus and his grandmother was the daughter of Ahab but the Jews in that time would not have counted that because she was a woman she wasn't a man the inheritance came through the men so the house of Ahab died even if not all his descendants died even though all of the house of Ahab including the women was killed in Israel in Judah we still have a few left but none are direct sons of Ahab descendants it's through a daughter which doesn't count um Again, how do you interpret history? And, but uh, Jehu is pursuing the worship of Yahweh the way he knows. And he's probably hoping that Elisha, who anointed him king, uh, indirectly, but you know, his authority anointed him as king, um, is going to back his kingdom. Verse 30, The Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in accomplishing what is right in the eyes, in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab all I had in mind to do, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Yet Jehu was not careful to keep the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sons of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. In those days, the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel. Haziel overpowered the Israelites throughout their territory, east of the Jordan, in all the land of Gilead, the region of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, and from the Aurora to the Arnon Gorge through uh, Gilead to Bashan. As for all the other events in Jehu's reign, all he did and all his achievements, are they not written in the book of the annuals of the kings of Israel? Jehu rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Jehoahaz, his son, succeeded him as king. The time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. So, the people in that day recognized, yeah, he worshipped Yahweh as in he worshipped the golden bulls that were at Bethel and Dan. He did not worship Yahweh at the temple in Jerusalem. and um, But in all the other ways, he obeyed God and had what God had told him through the prophets. And so Yahweh granted that his descendants would sit on the throne for four generations. And so the next three kings are going to be his son, grandson, and great-grandson. And um, we're, we're going to get to see how they functioned. 
But God was also beginning to pare Israel down. They lost a lot of territory. They lost people. They lost influence. Other kingdoms were on the rise. And uh, Hazel, who had been anointed king of Aram, um, starts making inroads and basically conquers to the Jordan River. Greatly diminishing um, the agricultural productivity of Israel. Uh, the land of Israel itself could produce grains and uh, vegetables and things like that, but to produce meat they needed the land that was Gilead, the other side of the Jordan. That was cattle country, that was sheep country, that was goat country. You could produce a few on a farm. You could keep a few oxen to keep plowing with. But you weren't going to produce great herds that produced meat and milk and hides and things like that. You would raise them to be farm animals. You didn't raise them to be meat animals. They were labor for you. They weren't a source of meat. Now, when your bull got old and couldn't plow more, sure, you wouldn't just let him die of old age without being able to use him. Uh, before he got to that point, you'd get a new bull and you'd kill that one and eat him. But by that point in time, he was kind of tough. It wasn't great meat. It was better than wasting him, though. And so that's how that was happened. They no longer had a source of meat. That was in another country. They had to be largely vegetarian. Oh, they could eat some meat. They didn't go without. I'm sure they bought some from a ram. But when you're having to buy your meat from your enemy, you don't eat as much. <laughs> and, you know, Jehu reigned 28 years, and he died. Next week, we'll pick up with what's happening in the southern kingdom in Judah uh, to finish out this cycle. Uh, we also now have the end of Omri's family that reigned for four generations. We now have Jehu's family who's going to reign for four generations. The last two dynasties in Israel that are worth much. They actually have kings and dynasties and they set policy and it continues from generation to generation, which is the way kingships sh should operate. And for most kingships, four generations is a very short dynasty. But that's the way it happened in Israel. Sure, in human terms, four generations is a a long reign. I mean, it's enough to shape the country and make it, you know, different than it was before. And Omri and his family had done that in a bad way. Jehu partially corrected that, but didn't go full way and overthrow what Jeroboam's son Nebat did. Up until this point, Omri is the, the first bow to rule four generations. Uh, Baasha, the um, next longest dynasty, he ruled three, and um, it was three generations. It was his legacy, and the rest of them were less than that. So, Jehu is going to be the last, sort of the last dynasty that makes a lasting difference in Israel. But he fails to follow through. Apparently he did import the Pentateuch and have people uh, using it. He paid attention to what Elisha said and the prophets that were under Elisha. And so they, you know, taught the law of the Lord. 
but they didn't go down to Jerusalem where the temple of the Lord was. They worshipped at the wrong temples, so to speak, in the wrong way. Holy Father, have us to worship you in spirit and truth, to do it correctly, to pay attention to every detail you tell us, and not to do only uh, our own thing. Have us to be faithful to you. Uh, that Correct us when we're wrong. Have us to do right. Have us to be faithful to you. Lord, we are thank you. We thank you for what you've been doing in our church lately. It's a great joy to see the baptisms, the people coming to know you. Have us to disciple these people well. Have us to be able to lead them into understanding you better and to studying your word and changing their lives to be in obedience to you. Lord, have us as a church to love each other and be united in love and to be able to reach out to the community and proclaim your love to others. Have us to not go halfway like Jehu did, where we quit worshiping the false gods, but then we worship the one true God incorrectly. Have us to worship you correctly. Have us to understand that it's by grace that we are saved. And it's mercy and grace that make us who we are. And that we're not, it's not legalism, it's not how we obey, but the spirit with which we obey. But have us to have that spirit of obedience that we will do it correctly. In your holy name, amen. I am your host, Frank Reich, Associate Pastor of Family and Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. And this has been the Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, July 31st, 2024. This was recorded on Saturday, uh, July 26th, 2024. And um, I hope to see you in church tomorrow. If not, I hope to see you at church Wednesday night. Um, if not, we'll see you here on YouTube. You have a blessed week.